Okay, we will get started. So today's talk is polyhedral analysis uh, using MLI as a fine dialect. I should have said 101. It's not all of them. We will only cover some of them. And it's an introduction. And it's a beginner friendly talk. MLIR beginner friendly talk. It is mainly to kind of uh, introduce if there is anyone who is interested and has not uh, already worked on MLIR things or affine things, polyhedral things, to get them started so that we have more and more engineers on it. And uh, we have got some amazing results at Polyimage Labs using some of these uh, affine compilation techniques or polyhedral compilation techniques in MLIR. We will show some of those results and uh, yeah, but this is a, again beginner friendly talk. If you have already used all of these things, it might sound a bit repetitive to some of uh, the people here. Uh, in which case, you can jump in, correct, comment. Feel free to stop me at any point, interrupt, and ask questions. Uh, so, agenda. We have. Uh, so again, as I said, there is no prerequisite. So we'll go over some of the basics of MLIR, and uh, we'll take a fine as an example. We will introduce some ops there, how, how they are structured. And uh, that, that's one part of the introduction. Second part is we will introduce polyhedral concepts. Polyhedral compilation is one of the compilation techniques. We will introduce some of the basic concepts of that. And now we will marry them and we will say how are polyhedral compilation techniques present in uh, MLIRs are fine. Uh, so again, the talk is about analysis and not transforms. So polyhedral transforms are there, optimizations are there. It The current talk only kind of builds it up, creates a ramp for what are the transforms. They, they'll come later. But today's talk is only about analysis. It doesn't transform things. We will just create a ramp for transforms. Uh, at the end, we will have a session for questions and comments. But uh, again, as I said, if you don't understand something or if there is any problem with a slide or anything, interrupt me and we can discuss it. It's a small crowd. We can, I think we can have all the questions. Okay, so what is affine? Without, again, we, even if we forget compilers and polyhedral and all those things, affine just means, affine functions usually mean linear plus constant. We know what a linear is. So affine just means linear plus constant. And given some variables, let's say i and j in this case, uh, I have marked some of the expressions that we can construct out of them in green and some of them in red. Green are affine expressions, affine functions of i and j. i plus j, all that, even floor div, all these are affine functions. And what is not affine? i square is not affine. Uh, sine, cosine of i is not affine. Or a of i, let's say there is a array and memory stored at ith index is not affine. These are the affine things. Uh, what about mod? So every mod, i mod k can be expressed as, th there will be enough math here in this uh, talk. So i minus uh, k mod star, so let's say. At this point, is this, does this make sense? All we are saying is instead of giving exp affine expressions there, we are creating one level of indirection. We are only going to give C0, C1 all the time. Whatever be the affine expression, we are going to give C0, C1. And who is going to handle which is the location? Some map will handle. And that map will take care of mapping the C0, C1 to C0 plus 10 and C1. Sorry, this one question I have. Like, uh the program that you are running right now, MLI, ROPT, is it, like, it's taking this payload as input and it's, you know, like, it's just printing that out? Okay? Yeah. It just yeah, correct. So in this case, I have not provided any pass. It, you can even, MLI, ROPT can do a lot of things. It can take passes and you can print things. In this case, it is, I am not giving any pass. I am just giving some option like gen, print it in a generic format. So it just parses it and prints it out. No transfer. It is not doing anything. So MLR OPT is a binary that is created inside MLR. So like uh, whatever you're doing text is uh, in that file, this is, this is exactly this. This is what you've actually written in that yes. MLR. And yes. normally something that is generated. Correct. I should have shown. So two dot. That's the. Okay. So you wrote the pretty printed version. 
Yeah. Something okay, so or something similar to that, and then this is after parsing, that's the output. That's the output. It can parse both the pretty printed version and the non pretty printed generic version. You can basically pipe it like this. Again, you can again pass pin and you are off. Basically, you are passing it again and again in the loop. And it can again pass and print the same because you are not giving any, any other pass. This is this is good. So we are we are going to introduce one more op, one or two more ops here, and then we'll go to polyhedral analysis. Is that fine? Is this the, is the speed of the talk fine or any, any change? A fine store is very similar. How would we define it? Uh, it doesn't return any value. It only stores things. So it also takes the extra operand. The, the thing it has to store, it takes that as an extra operand. The rest of the things again remain the same. Good. The affine part of this operation is that the, uh, the address at which I want to put it, let's compute that the value, the function that computes it is affine. That's what yes, it is. yes. Okay. The affine, the core affine here is these maps, these indices, they are all affine. You cannot say uh, CST star CST. No. Or uh, let's say you are in a loop, you cannot say I star I and try to access it by affine. It will throw an error then. So using, again, by using these affine load and store, we are restricting it to only call or load from only certain locations or in only certain way so that we can analyze it later. Analysis will come later, but this is how I, we are restricting it. You cannot load from anything else. So I can also tell you that there is something called memref load, which is more generic. Mm -hmm. It just says from this memref and this location load. Mm -hmm. Now there are no restrictions on that. On that. You can give i star i, it'll load it. But again, because you can load it, you cannot analyze and say you can do you cannot do the same analysis that you would do here no. on that. So if if the output is a uh, uh, address generated, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a case where uh, the address generated is not a fine address? Like square root of i wouldn't make any sense, right? Is there a case where it is not a fine? Yeah. Oh, you're saying input program where affine load will not work and memory load will work? Uh, no, what I mean is whatever, so percentage CST uh, plus 10 is there here, right? Mm -hmm. so instead of that, if it is like something like square root or something, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't make sense, the address generated would not make any sense, right? Uh, square root of what you can... Take the you? operator. You cannot create the map for that, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is that affine trans transformations that that map is handling, that map cannot be created by under root i. So you cannot have under root i as an index. So you're, you're saying it doesn't make sense, the square root will never occur because it make, no, makes no sense? That's For an operator to generate an address. Uh, okay, square root is difficult. Let's say a of b of i, that can happen. That, that is possible, yes. But I think what he's saying is if you do like CST 0 plus root 10, mm -hmm. the value that you get is not a valid index. Is that yeah. uh, again uh, root of ten in this case is not expressible as an index itself. So that operation, when you are creating a square root, you would write square root of. Oh the, yes. So uh, my question here is: so in in since those are not valid at all, mm -hmm. then what would be the opposite of a affine load? There, there yeah, wouldn't so be. What would be the affine of a of b of i is an affine load, is a non-affine load. Okay. So you gather operations in. TF gather. Mm -hmm. So there you, you, you want to load something and you don't know exactly at compile time what where to load from. The location from which you have to load from gives is given by A of I. Okay. And you go there and then add the offset and get it. That's a non-affine access. Uh, one more is let's say you have an array and uh, you want to load from a location which is either uh, some location, let's say i, i minus 1 or 0, whichever is bigger. So you, you don't know where it will be at compile time. You, you know it only at runtime. So the index that you calculate will be if less than 0, uh, then 0. Otherwise, that. That again is not a fine. It cannot be loaded like this. 
Okay. But that's an option. Remember to select. Yeah. Affine store, this is an example. Affine store. It, it follows the same thing as affine store. So I'll just skip it. Okay, affine for. So this is the last stop that we will introduce in this session and then we'll jump right to analysis. So all these affine load, affine store, they're needed for the next analysis. That's why I, I have to introduce. Affine for, if we want to define, how would we define? We would have a lower bound and we would have an upper bound. We would also mention a step, the step counter in which it will go. And it will have a body. That's enough to define a for. And that's how it is actually created. And lower bound, upper bound, again, they are affine expressions. They don't have to be constants. They can be affine expressions. And we already know how to create affine expressions. We can give affine operands, some operands, and then an affine map, it will give you affine expressions. Sounds good. So lower bounds are defined by affine map and their operands. Upper bounds, affine map and operand. They are basically affine expressions. There is a step and there is a body. This is how exactly affine for is defined upstream. Upstream of affine for also has exact exactly all these things, but it also also allows you to define something else. It allows you to return a value. It allows you to take something called iteration arguments. It's just for completeness, I am mentioning this. We will not use that in this talk. Okay, We will stick to this, this definition of affine for where it doesn't return any value. It just goes from something to something in these steps and it has a word. And something to something, whenever you say lower bound and upper bound, they have to be affine expressions of something, of some valid values. The step cannot be an affine expression, it has to be No. The currently what we define, it has to be a constant. It, it has to be a compile time known constant. So it should be something like like this. Step here is actually one. That's why it's not, again not pretty printed. But otherwise, step two will will make a set, will make sense. But you cannot say step i. It's not. You cannot define it. Sounds good. So this is how we define a fine for. These bodies are empty here. Hmm. Another thing to note. Uh, is let's say you have uh, let's say you, you are inside the function now there is a block right which contains a fine for this nested for if you start iterating on the block the first op and the second op and the third op it basically block has list of ops if you go start from the top and go iterate over the ops not walk over the ops, just iterate over the ops, you will only see one affine for inside the first block. And the second affine for is nested inside the first one. So if you are walking from here, if you are iterating from the top, you will only see one affine for and one return. It doesn't know about the inner affine for if you are iterating. That's how, again, ops are organized. So this affine for is inside the outer affine for that block. But uh, func dot func doesn't know that this exists. It only cares about the outer affine for. So uh, regarding the step, uh, that step can also be part of the affine map. Uh, step is basically, it has to be a constant, like 3 or 4. Right. Uh, yeah. But in the sense that the affine expression can also have a, a sprite, right? Step is like a sprite. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Right, but the sprite can itself be part part of the affine map or uh, the uh, you know the affine expression. So you said that it has to be a compile time constant. Yeah. But uh, if, for example, if you have this i zero ranging from zero to ten, mm -hmm. so if you do something like i zero into two, mm -hmm. so you always go to alternate locations, not all the locations. Then the step is not one, and uh, it's a it's a fine expression there. Uh, in this, in this, let's say. Yes, the first one. I zero is there. So this loop is going to execute 10 times, 0 to 9. Right? Yes. Because the step is 1. Now inside that you can create 2 star I zero. And you can use it. But now 2 star I zero will range from 0 to 18. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
Uh, what I'm saying is uh, the step, oh, why do we need an additional step? Because the step can also be brought into the affine map itself, right? Is that possible? So there are two affine maps. One is for the lower bound. Right. One affine map is for the upper bound. Right. The step is not in any affine map. It's just a combined and constant. Okay. They're defined by C0, C1, C2, C3, something like that. I think it can't even be a function argument that's in class and it's a part of the affine for it to throw an error. But for example, the inner loop, if it goes from 0 to say 1000, mm -hmm. and you have i0 into 2 as a step inside mm. for the in inner loop. In the this step? Yeah, here the step, step is. can be i0. That's a very good question. So you are saying that can I make this? See, can I say step 2 star percentage i0? Can yes. I make this? Yes. No, this is not allowed. Is it? This is the step here. Here has to be a constant. It cannot be anything else. So in this case, it's an affine expression. Yeah. We created an affine expression. So steps cannot be affine expressions. In again, it is not a limitation of MLIR where we are restricting steps to be not be affine expressions. If you allow steps to be uh, affine expressions, the space that you get out of it will not be affine. We will again come to that. It doesn't remain a fine. It has to be a constant. Only then you can uh, analyze the program here. If you yes. if you allow them to be affine expressions, the space will not be affine anymore. Again, it becomes something called semi-affine. Uh, again, beyond the scope of this topic, uh, it, it, the analysis are very different. They are difficult. So, like instead of let's say two into i zero, it was like two into some uh, other variable, like some x. Yeah, and x and is the constant. Uh, x is at least a constant within that for loop, let's say. It's like it doesn't change within that for loop. Then. Uh, but it comes out on that thing, right? Then how does it? It's still a variable. It has to be. Uh, no, it, it'll not be allowed. It'll not be allowed. Uh, if you say something like uh, C0, let's say, at the top. And in fact, it will not even parse it, but uh, no, it has, to be a, it has to be a one number. It has to be a constant. It doesn't have to be. Basically, what you can have is. Define a constant here, and then use it as a step. Like what I should understand is if my source program has like a step defined in the form of a variable, right? Then no, then I don't know. No, I agree. so runtime you can pass the step. Let's say uh -huh. no, it has to, again. It will not remain a fine then. It's not a compile time constant. Then. Yeah, it has to be. A, it has to be known. this okay so so far we have seen what is a fine some of the dialects maybe MLIR are fine load store for these are the things that we are going to use later we know what affine expressions are any questions on how we have defined the ops Before this, I mean the IR that is for the number three, file number three. File number three? Yeah. This is only three. So it's what you have said, uh, this constant can be treated as a symbol rather than dimensional identifiers, right? Correct. So, but in the format, it was seen as dimensional identifiers. Correct. So yeah, okay, that's a little confusing. So in this case, they are allowed to be dimensions. They are fine, even though there's so they, there are some there are something called symbols. Uh, exactly what you are saying. If for this scope, it is compile time known and it doesn't change. Nobody does n equal to n plus one somewhere in between. That n is called a symbol now. For this affine scope, there is something called a affine scope. In this case, n doesn't change and it's a constant. They are called symbols. Uh, in this case, it's allowed to be dimensional. It doesn't cause any problem. But uh, it, there are some cases where they, it will not be allowed to be. Uh, for example, if you try to define uh, a for loop with it, and if you pass CST0 as uh, a, a, an argument to that, then it will be detected as simple. So things are a little stricter for fors. Uh, and this is an outside affine, affine load and affine store. They are at the outermost scope of the function. They are not inside any affine point. So they are more, lenient, they are more lenient at this stage. 
but if you push them inside a park then there are a lot more rules of life even i am not very comfortable and very familiar with those that's why i just eliminated symbols uh, from the talk yeah what a good question thank you anything else i is x here the first one it is this half space uh, i less than or equal to 5 was this half space and similarly j greater than or equal to 2 was this half space and there is a lower bound as well so with the intersection of all these we got a nice rectangle and that is the iteration domain of uh iteration domain of the subbind store which is contained that that's how it is represented okay so this is the intersection of fast spaces so this is how iteration domains work so this is one of the basic structures that we will use for uh, affine analysis you, somebody can ask the question how many times this runs how many times actually affine dot store runs if you construct Uh, all this iteration domain, and if you see how many points are there, that is the answer to this. Or if somehow you constructed an affine for, and you ask the question, how many points are there in the iteration domain, and it returns zero, there are no valid points because of somehow you created the bounds. It means there are no iterations, so you can eliminate that list. You can okay. probably delete it. So iteration domain, I'm just. carrying forward from the previous uh, previous slide in mlir how they are represented so they they are represented as a constraint system so i j is here right uh, i hope you can see constraint system mlir this is the table that's how it is represented it basically means 1 into i 0 into j 1 into minus 1 this last one is 1 is greater than or equal to 0 is implicit here in the inequality so there are four of them which represent exactly four constraints that we have and there are no equalities in this example but there might be equalities they are listed separately there are inequalities and inequalities this is called flat linear value constraints in the affine mlir affine world they used to be called flat affine constraints now they made it flat linear constraints which is a recent change this is a structure which basically constraint contains any questions is is this okay are you following this so the space that you earlier showed is yes. this is this table representing that yes, yes. that's exactly that. so uh, these were the constraints the these were the constraints for that okay. and i just brought them brought them forward and this is the table so these are the inequalities representing the same iteration yes. space yes again a little more math here there is what happens if we have steps what do we have and uh, steps are always there they are unavoidable how do we deal with them there is a little bit of math here in this slide so consider the following nest i equal to 1 to 6 step 2 which means the iterations will be 1 3 5 right but if you just say i greater than or equal to 1 i less than or equal to 5 it will look like this but it is an incorrect uh, incorrect iteration domain it, it, this is not true so this is not the iteration space a side stepping solution is just to normalize the loop i think someone was asking about it you can normalize you can consume the steps inside and you can make it go from 1 to uh, yeah 1 2 3 and replace it inside inside the body percentage i becomes percentage i start to plus one uh, why is this not a space because 2 and 4 don't belong to the space yes yeah yes. they they should not have been there right but uh, it, they are contained so again normalizing the loop is one solution many people many times we do it but there are some places where it cannot be avoided it, it's just no way to so the reason we are having this 2 and 4 in the iteration space they should not have been there and there still there is we didn't care about the step at all even if it was one we would have put it so the way you care about the step is you say i here basically i minus lb lower bound mod step equal to 0 that's how you would care you would add this equality and then it should have magically worked right 
So how do we add it is what the next slide contains. If it is too much math and it is too boring, we can skip it. But this is how it should be added. So any a mod k, we have seen that it can be represented as a minus this expression. Now we define a new variable. It's called a local variable. This is again important. In, if you are going through MLIR code, then you will see these local variables a lot of the times in all the polyhedral, not just MLIR, in all the polyhedral analysis tools, non-MLIR as well. There are something called local variables and they are really important because of this reason. So A mod K can be written as this and we define a new variable called Q equal to A flow K. So basically this we are going to redefine and make it a new variable. So once you say Q is equal to A floor K, it gives you more constraints to add. Basically means if you take A and if you floor divide it, you get some number that you call that Q. Now Q star K, whatever you just divided with, is probably same as A or A is at most K minus 1 away from here. It has to be within this range. That's the definition of floor div and that's how constraint system will take it. Good. This, this is how A flow div K gives you more constraints, at least two additional constraints. Okay. Sealed divs can be converted into floor divs all the time. So this is the expression. So sealed divs. So mods are handled, floor divs are naturally handled. That's how we are adding them in the first way. And uh, sealed divs are also handled. That's, that basically covers all the kinds of affine expressions. Mm -hmm. that so this is how the iteration space now will look like. You added a new variable called k, it was not there in the iteration space. Mm -hmm. Iteration space was, if, if you remember, it was i goes from something to something with some step. q did not exist. And you created q and you added an inequality and we can work through the math but j j trust me on this, this is how it will look like. After uh, you have added a new variable called q there. Now this Q is called local variable. It is ubiquitous, you can see it everywhere. Uh, it is local because it doesn't exist in the program time. It is just serving the purpose of this analysis. Uh, we will work, if there is time at the end, we will, we will work through the math of it. Now, what exactly is the equality representing? This equality? Yeah. Uh, in the earlier case, uh, this one, Q equal to A floor div K. So, it is representing that. So, let us let us see how it is. So, it is saying that I minus 2 Q minus 1 equal to 0. I minus 1 equal to 2 Q. It is representing that. So, A uh, in our case, A is basically I minus 1. Is that clear? So, that was the constraint in the previous slide. It is the constraint in the previous slide. In this case, uh, this I minus LB, LB is 1 here. Lower bound is 1. So, this is the A there in the next slide. So, the K in the next slide is 2, the step. Yes. that is the equality and additional inequalities that it gave. These inequalities are here. Uh, these i equal to i less than i greater than, this, they were there already. So those two inequalities are like this one rolled out. Okay. This and this and this one. Two inequalities. Okay. Okay, so we have something called affine relation. We, we touched upon it earlier when you said this d not d1 d2 it translates into something an affine expression. So when you have when you have two affine spaces, you can relate them. You can basically create a relation from domain to range. This goes to this. You can create a relation like that. Affine relation is a first class concept in MLIR. You can create them, and how they are created that is something. You can create a relation. Most commonly used one that we wanted to see earlier even was access relation. You are given an iteration space. You basically you translate and you map it to memory location uh, and you want to constrain and basically you want to say this iteration uh, targets this memory location. How do we say it? The access, uh, access relation is exactly that. 
So in this case, i goes from 1 to 6 and it stores into mem i plus 1. This is valid. right? So now what we want to do is from i to let's say this mem whatever it here is that we want to construct a map towards it as in given this iteration what is the location that it is accessing. We want to construct a map. And it, it exactly looks like this. In the earlier case, basically m is a memory location, let, let's say, we want to represent. It is i plus 1. All the inequalities of the iteration space remain the same with one additional inequality, where it says m equal to this plus this. It is basically this plus this plus this is 0, which means m equal to i plus 1, which is what we wanted. So this is what access relations look like. Access relation is one of the affine relation. You can create different access relations like this. Now, why this is important? Sorry, I see which part, like when you say access relation, uh, that expression is an access relation, the affine dot store expression. Mm. Sorry? You're saying that the affine dot store expression, is that as an access relation or is the, the inequalities and equalities are together? So this is, the, this is the access relation. Okay. So it established relation between iteration space and the memory location. Number of specification. This is how they are constrained. Iteration space is this. I goes from this to this. And whenever I goes from that to that, m is this. So for any given i, you will get what is the m. So you are calling it an access relation because it has been used in a store expression. Or, or like, uh, memory access relation, that's the full form. Uh, that's why I am calling it. It's, it's a relation. It's an affine relation. Access relation is how an iteration space accesses the, the, the memory. So uh, it is the, uh, like uh, how is it different from a fine function? Like is it the uh, we, we we give it a memory location mm -hmm. and it will give us the iteration. Uh, Correct. Is it the? It is a, in fact that is how it is constructed. Using an affine map, we construct it with affine relation in in the form of this. Okay. Right. No, it is a building step again to the toward the next thing. I want to say there is something called an inverse of a relation. Okay. I am going towards that. That's why. So, okay. So, so the question uh, is that, like, uh, for a uh, for a given access, uh, there will be only one re result. If we uh, like for a given access, there will be a map, right? And if we give uh, like uh, the in, uh, like uh, the iteration IDs to get as input, it will give only one output. Correct. So that should be a function, right? So uh, this relation would be used as a like inverse, some kind of inverse to that. Map. Like we give it a memory location and it will give the mm -hmm. uh, identifiers, like mm -hmm. map uh, iteration space which will access that particular memory location. Correct. So, which is the inverse relation? So given a memory going towards iteration space is the inverse of whatever okay. this is doing. Okay. Closely related. But what you are saying is if we have iteration space and we have an affine map, why do I even need this? Is that the question? So if we express it as a constraint system, that's the next step. So I want to create an inverse, in which case iteration space and affine map was enough. Uh, if you want to go back, you would probably create some other space and then a map, right? So and it is easier to construct it here. Okay. Okay. So iteration space and this, if you, you can easily invert it. In fact, inverse is a ready function which is available to you. Okay. You can inverse it. When you say relation and inverse relation, are they like the mathematical terms relations? Yes. yes. Okay. Relation, which is just before function. Yeah, yeah. It, it's exactly that. Okay. Uh, let's use one of these access relations. So consider a store op and a load op. They exist somewhere uh, in the program somewhere. They access the same membre. We don't know if they access the same location or not. They or just function. by looking at it, you see that they access the same hash map, same memory. Now, access relation for store of will look something like this. IVs of store indices of access of that memory. If there are local variables, if there is a flow div somewhere, you will have to add some local variables. You will add that. Finally, there is a one. This is how it will look like. It will contain equalities and inequalities. Both of them. Sounds good? Passing it. Yeah, we will take that. Yeah. 
here the load and store uh, refers to the affine load and capacity. Yeah, uh, yeah. Affine store of affine load of that, those are the options. Yeah. Again, if they were memory of load, then we would not be able to construct these, right? Okay. So this is how access relation of any load or store would look like. Yeah, I didn't, I had added it, I removed it because it is too confusing. Yeah. But this is, this is one of the examples. This is how it would. So here, I here is the iteration space. This is the one dimensional iteration space. M is the access indices. And one is one. There are no local variables in this. And that's, that's pretty much the same thing. This is I, this is M. This doesn't exist one. The same thing. Load will have the exact same thing. Now what we can do basically is we can invert and join them. There is no some there's join is a wrong term here in the affine word. There's something called invert and compose. Okay. But let's say because we all are familiar with databases. Let's invert and join. Basically what I mean is let's say this location is a return to by which store iterations and the same location is read by which load instances. Let's say I create them and I join them. I'll have store IVs, I'll have load IVs, probably some local variables and one. But I'll basically establish store and load constraint system in such a way that they are accessing the same location. I'm sure of that because I have made sure of that. Not just in the same memory location. Yeah, not just mem, exact same locations. Okay. Because I can I created inverses, and I said for this i j k or let's say m n o uh, location m n location, which are the storing operations, and for the same m n, which are the loading operations, and basically I eliminated these columns, and whatever rest it was there, I joined. Okay. So this is exactly what is called a dependence polyhedron, which is you have a store, you have a load, one of them has to be a, a right effect of and it's empty. The, the join is about store op and load ops, right? What about, what is the invert there? Invert is basically you have the access relation, usually the default direction is from iteration space to empty location. Um, iteration space to memory location. Yeah. For these iteration space, this is the memory location. Okay. Now you can only invert them. So the actual dependence polyhedron construction inside MLIR, it inverts one of them and joins. It is basically, it's a join. I, I don't know. Jo but, but invert is that which I didn't get it. Invert is for this location which are the accesses. If I invert that relation. Again, mathematical inversion. Uh -huh. so for this location, what is the memory access? Yeah. So uh, this for what? location, what is the iteration which is accessing? That is the inverse. That's the inverse. Okay, so from i comma j to uh, you know i plus j is uh, is the power, and i plus j to i comma j is the inverse. That's the reason. Uh, i j to can, can you repeat this? No, I comma j is the iteration space, yeah. and to the i plus j is the access. i plus j is the access, yes. Yeah, so the inverse that you're talking about is i plus j to the i comma j. Yeah. Inverse relation can also have, it, it's not always one to one, it's a, just like a mathematical relation. Mm -hmm. it, it does not mean uh, iteration will only write to some locations. But why, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to do this inverse relation join and all that? Uh, between those and those, uh, to construct this dependence polyhedron, that was, that was the goal of doing that. And we will use uh, dependence polyhedron next in the next few slides. For optimization. For yeah, for optimizations. When we say, whenever we want to transform, we want to say that this is a dependence polyhedron and no one violates this. Hmm. No one should violate it. So none of the dependencies are violated. So we want to create this dependence polyhedron. So if I want to say it like this, that uh, for a certain memory location, I have arrived at a conclusion that, say, second iteration is reading, uh, so, so writing, and fourth iteration is reading it. 
Okay. So this is the kind of information I want. Yeah. And then later on, as I think what I understand is you're saying that it should not never be violated. Correct. So yes. if second is reading, fourth you can bring to third or whatever, but it should not be violated in such a way that you end up reading some old value, stale value. Exactly. That's how. Simplest is I cannot parallelize. If second and yeah. fourth are yeah. feeding values into each other, I cannot say run everything in parallel. But if I know that there is no dependence, I can say run this loop in parallel. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what we will do next. But uh, again, the reason for not including an example is examples are for a two loop nest of two depth. It becomes four dimensional. And if there is a floor div, it, each floor div adds one column and two or three more rows. So it, usually if you debug, if you print or dump the dependence polyton, they are huge. They, are, they take time to understand. So this is again a representation. We will again probably in the next session we will dig deep. Using the dependence polyhedron. So we constructed the dependence polyhedron. Wh- wh- why do we even need it? This is fundamental for legality of transforms, what we just discussed. So whenever you want to transform, you want to say that it does not violate any of the dependence. All the dependence is present. That's how you want to you want to reason about it. So there are Simple things, again, polyhedral transforms, there are things like loop skewing, loop interchange, uh, loop tiling, loop fusion, all, all of those things are there. Let, let's simply just say that this is the iteration space that I am given, there is some loop, loopness time given. Then how do we say, how do we just extract some parallelism out there and some tiling out there? Let, let's practice it. Let's say this is how iteration space looks like. And again, I have represented dependences as arrows because it is simpler to do so. It is easier to reason about them. X is the first dimension, horizontally is the first dimension. That is Y is the second dimension. Now, by looking at it, by if we construct the dependence polyhedron and if we ask the question, is X parallelly executable? The answer is yes. You can execute all of the iterations of X. You can start all of them together and let them run on their own. You don't have to worry about it violating any dependence. So this information that X is parallel is conclude. We can conclude only after constructing the dependence plate. I again, I haven't shown how to do it, but this is one example. So they were like a, again a question on the previous thing. But, but uh, like I understood why you took the inverse. Uh, why why did you have to do a join after? So that I represent, so the final result I want to have, the relation I want to have is constraint system, I want some source IVs and some destination IVs. That's all. Uh, so that I can say these source IVs depend on these. So I want to ask the question, let's say. Uh, the, 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 the dependency relation itself can be established only when you are considering both. So unless you join loads with stores, that's what my understanding is. Mm-hmm. If you are only looking at loads, iterations, then there's nothing to know. You, you want to know that if you're loading in these iterations, then on the same locations, which iterations are story? So we thought that ordering information was outside the polyhedron. That is what you had said. Like the ordering information is separately captured. Ordering information is in one of those constraints. The dates of each, they capture these. Let's say even if the ordering, okay, let's say these are the locations, stores is storing, these are the iterations storing to it, these are the load, loads loading from it, these are the instances of loads from it. And somehow outside I know that stores happen before loads. Now after the transform I want to know again make sure that stores, all of the stores have happened before the loads have started happening. This is what I want to do. For that, instead of keeping this memory location in the picture, I'll say for these loads, which are the stores that should already have happened? That's the question I want to ask. Okay, so let's say for a second that uh, if you have, uh, let's say memory address X, in which uh, there is first a store, then a load, then another store. Okay. Then you will end up with, uh, let's say, uh, in the relation, rather like uh, the, Access relation that you were talking about, 
there will be one source, ra rather uh, the x will be the destination in the first one, mm -hmm. and the, the source in the next one, and then again the destination in the third one. Correct. That is how you are establishing the ordering and the dependencies. There, now there are three operations that are happening on the same memory. Right. Now there is dependencies always between two pairs, so you construct three dependence polyhedrons. Store to load, load to store, store to store. There is a rate after rate dependence. So three dependencies, and then you reason about if I transform it, none of these three dependencies are valid. Again, we probably with an example, it would have been simpler. The simple example, I think it should have been good. I should have tried that, but let's see. So this is an example of outer parallelism. Let's say somehow we have constructed dependencies and we have represented them as arrows. This is outer parallel. Outer loop itself is parallelism. Uh, if outer loop is not parallel, it doesn't mean there is no parallelism. Let's say the dependence scheme is like this. Again, x is the first, y is the second. Now let's pick each x and let's execute them in serial order but you can still get some parallelism there. So inner loop you can probably run in parallel. So this dependence polyhedron would tell you that first loop you cannot parallelize, you'll have to serialize it, but once you are running it in serial, next of the things are parallel. In polyhedral world, it is called carrying a dependence. A loop, basically carrying as in the weight of the, the burden of carrying that dependence or satisfying that dependence is on this loop. So if you just satisfy, if that loop is run in serial order, so the burden has already been taken care of by that loop. So inner loops don't have to care for that. That's what is happening. Uh, so there are some tiling examples I have. Again, dependence polyhedron can be used to say which of the tilings are valid, which of the tilings are not valid. In this case, the one on the left is a valid tiling. Tile, I hope you, it's, a, it's kind of, you cut the iteration space into different blocks and you execute all of that. Basically, you're changing the order in which different iterations would happen. So that uh, you basically are trying to uh, optimize for locality. So you, instead of going from executing everything here, you would execute these four and then move on to the next. That's the, the definition of tiling. So dependence polyhedrons also tell you which loop is tileable and which is not. So in this case, this is, this is a valid tile or if you tile it, it will work. But let's say if you take that and if you tile it, that's, a, that's an invalid yeah. order because there are values going from here to here and here to here. So these two tiles, none of them can be automatic, uh, automatically schedulable. They depend on each other. So they will each wait for the other to complete none of them can work, none of them can be scheduled. So uh, each tile has to be automatically schedulable. This is again, I'm listing the uses of dependence polyhedron. Uh, we have a few more slides, but I again, I want to check with the audience how comfortable they are with, again, going with a few more newer concepts. No one is saying no, no one is saying yes. <laughs> Okay, I, I'll just finish, uh, flash through them fast. If there are any questions, stop. Let's say there is a nest, a producer nest. We call it a producer nest because it is storing some values. It is creating some values inside this mem member. There is something called a consumer nest because it is loading. Okay. Let's say I perform some transform. I pull that whole producer thing and I put it inside consumer at this stage. Now it, I, it, it is stupid to do it because this will run those many number of times more, j times more. Um, so this iteration space now becomes j times i. It is true, but let's say I do it. And it is still valid. It will just write so many number of times, but this will only read one time. This is still valid, right? So I will I'll get to why I am doing this. So this is loading something. 
just like dependence analysis that we did where we said this load has to happen after these stores i can also say this load is consuming values from these stores this exact stores so i can say for this particular jth so j goes from 0 to something right it, it goes from into a range let's say j equal to 5 this iteration is loading from this location which is the iteration which is writing from uh, the producer i can calculate it right with again with the same dependencies i can calculate which is the store which is writing it let's say i realize that fifth iteration of the load has dependence on sixth iteration of that store which means basically if i just execute that sixth iteration just before this i'm fine i am executing everything but i just need to execute sixth so what we are trying to say here is depending on what we are exactly what we are loading here we don't have to run the whole producer loop we can only run some exact slice of that uh, producer we don't have to run everything so we can bring in only the slice of slice of that iteration space just like a bread slice slice of that into this and place it here it is still work let's say after adjusting the bounds we realize that for each iteration that is loading exactly only one iteration is writing and we brought that in which basically means these for ops bounds would uh, they became something like something to something plus 1 it became a one iteration loop one iteration loop can be now eliminated the body can be now promoted right so it will look something like this so from two loops which is producing and consuming we have arrived at one loop here all the dependencies are satisfied and this is called a fine fusion and this is slicing based of fine fusion so you have a load you calculate what is storing to it cut that slice and bring it in and if you are lucky probably only one iteration is there so that you can promote everything and effectively you have fused two loops slicing fusion is one of the different fusions that one of the many fusion techniques that people follow people uh, but this is very powerful this is very accurate and powerful and this is present in affine memory so the reason why i kind of discussed about it is this is a transform now so i had said we will talk about some of the analysis and then we will talk at transforms why why these analysis are required for transforms so this is a transform fine fusion is a transform probably it will be a topic in or somebody can take it up and discuss it in next few sessions uh, but yeah that's a transform and we at polyvage labs we have been using many of these analysis as well as transforms for the past few months and years and we have uh, we have some amazing results but i i'll only focus on fusion now because that's what i have introduced so this is a chart on nvidia a100 with some of the benchmarks dl benchmarks uh, this is basically speed up on uh, without fusion to with fusion so if you enable fusion if you did all this constructor dependence polyhedron pulled the slice promoted on i don't i forgot the geometric mean here but you can see unit vg19 here twice speed up without fusion to with fusion uh, it can even be as high as 3 it is reaching 4 for one of the benchmarks this is batch size 1 similarly batch size eight we have similar speed up so a fine fusion is across op optimization it is machine independent it, it, it basically fusion is you don't need not be uh, need to know what is the target so independent optimization uh, but yeah we have many more results and many more comparison direct mode to one run time comparison do you know what is the work so work i think it's 15 to 20 seconds maybe 15 to 20 seconds again fusion is one of the culprit mm. yeah because it does a lot of analysis and it is pair wise right every store and every load you have to construct yeah, this is like i think bird large uh, 20 24 layers 20 this bird base yeah but uh, this is just with fusion without fusion but we will soon 
make uh, many of all, all the end to end compiled times with all other transforms public. Uh, okay, conclusion. So we have introduced a fine MLI dialect, we have seen different ops, how they are constructed. We have introduced basic concepts of uh, polyhedral analysis like addition domain, dependence polyhedron, and how they are used. Uh, maybe a few use cases of polyhedral analysis, like when the loop is parallel, when it can be tight, and also we have seen a teaser for slicing based fusion. We haven't seen fusion, but analysis for that is already discussed. So if somebody wants to try, I just listed some of the exercises, if somebody is interested, uh, they can try on MLIR, you can, you, you can try it again, slide will be shared, you can take a look at them. And Probably the next logical step of this talk would be to discuss transforms, optimizations, using the uh, polyhedral analysis that we have built. Uh, it should be the next step. Uh, yeah. So, thank you all for coming on a Sunday afternoon and listening in patience, patiently. And thank you for the mainly organizers. This is a very nice venue. Uh, yeah. Thank you for organizing the talk. And uh, yeah, at Polymage Labs, we are constantly hiring. So if anybody is interested in all the work that we do here, please reach out to Gary Thank you.